Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in. Help us wrap up the week here on this Friday. We're going to continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, particularly Emperor Constantine's ruling of the Council of Nice and dispelling this monstrous fabrication that somehow the Bishop of Rome at that time was regarded as a bishop of bishops or that he presided over this council or that he convened this council or that the council uh, established the primacy and the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome calling him the vicegerent of God and the head and mother of all churches. It's a a gigantic fabrication by the Roman Catholic Church, this assertion that the Bishop of Rome has primacy or divine right to rule the world. A monstrous fabrication. And we're going to tear away at this presumption that is accepted as fact by so many around the world and that literally forms the basis for the New World Order which I repeat is the old world order restored. When the Pope controlled the world, he um, nominated, crowned, and seated all the kings, and all the kings of the earth paid homage to him. And they ruled the people in the Pope's behalf. Literally, the governor of the world, and that's what is, is, is in the offing for the world, for those who don't wake up to the reality of this new world order. Now, beginning with the first full paragraph on page 305, backing up just a few sentences for continuity purposes this morning, page 305, the first full paragraph, the author R.W. Thompson says, The council was disturbed at the very beginning by angry discussion among the discordant bishops. Says Eusebius, quote, some began to accuse their neighbor, who defended themselves and recriminated in their turn, unquote. He continues, quote, In this manner, numberless assertions were put forth with, uh, by each party, and a violent controversy arose at the very commencement, unquote. So it was a very rowdy uh, assembly at the very beginning. And it says, the contending parties seem to have addressed themselves not merely to this, the assembly itself, but to the emperor. Why? Because the emperor was in charge, not the bishop of Rome. It says, manifestly, he was regarded as the ruling spirit of the council. He probably did not attempt to employ this imperial authority to control the deliberations, but it is unquestionably true that they were mainly influenced by the deference paid to it by a majority of the prelates. So all the prelates acknowledged the temporal authority of, of uh, Caesar, not the Bishop of Rome, who wasn't even there. He was only represented by two presbyters. Uh, uh, the Bishop of Rome at that time, the so-called Pope, Pope Sylvester, they call him a saint, was an old man. He couldn't make it to the council. He sent representatives, two priests. And it says, it is probable even that many of them were absolutely governed by this, by it, meaning this temporal power of Caesar and his control over the, uh, over the council, his empirical power over the, over his imperial power over the council. And it says, Eusebius says as much in this that notwithstanding the violence of the discussion, quote, the emperor gave patient audience to all alike, not the pope, but the emperor gave patient audience to all alike and received every proposition with steadfast attention and by occasionally assisting the argument of each party in turn, he gradually disposed even the most vehement disputants to a reconciliation, unquote. So there you have Caesar kind of mending all the wounds, helping everyone in their arguments and their rebuttals and making reconciliation. No mention of the Pope here. 
And it says, by his address and his eloquence in the Greek language, he persuaded some and convinced others, quote, until at last he succeeded in bringing them to one mind and judgment respecting every disputed question, unquote. In other words, Constantine hit a grand slam. He brought everybody to reconciliation. A very contentious, heated, and divisive council at the beginning were reduced to reconciliation at the end by the emperor, not by the pope. And it says the result thus produced was, quote, that they were not only united as concerning the faith, but also as the time of the celebration of Easter, whereupon the quote-unquote points were, were committed to writing and received the signature of each several member, unquote, and a festival was solemnized in honor of God. In all this, there is no mention made of the Bishop of Rome or any instructions from him or of any formula of faith prepared by him or of anything said or done by his legates. Now, we all understand Pope Sylvester was silent because he wasn't there, and he was represented by two priests, and they were silent as well, basically just observers of the council. And it says, the emperor himself is the front figure in the assembly. All others are in the background. Sozeman says that after Constantine had burned all the complaints of the contending bishops against each other that had been handed to him for investigation, he took part in the deliberations of the council. He heard each party for and against Arius, and after the condemnation of Arius by the council, sent his followers into banishment by an imperial decree. Not a papal decree, an imperial decree. This is the empire speaking. Constantine, not the bishop of Rome. It says the quote-unquote confession or the quote-unquote symbol of faith was decided on with his approval, Caesar's approval. This is not inserted in Sozeman's history because he thought, quote, that such matters ought to be kept secret from the unlearned and to be known only by the disciples and their instructors, unquote. But he nowhere mentions any instructions from Rome or any participation by the Pope's legates in the proceedings of the council. The account given by Socrates agrees with that of Eusebius, from whom it is taken, but he gives the, quote, confession of faith, unquote, and points out the manner of its adoption without any reference to the Bishop of Rome or his legates or any instructions from him. Theodoret is somewhat specific as to the manner in which the creed was adopted, predicating his statements upon the authority of a letter written by Athanasius immediately after the council to the Christians of Africa. Alluding to the bishops, he says, quote, they all agreed in propounding certain declarations of faith, yet he does not include the Arians among these, for they stated their quote-unquote conclusions in such a way as, according to him, to expose their evil design and impious artifice. He states the final adoption of the symbol of faith and gives also an important letter from Eusebius to Caesarea, the historian, which throws much additional light upon the character of the proceedings and the personal agency of Constantine in fixing the terms of the formulary. It shows indeed that the word consubstantial, the most important and conspicuous word in the creed, was inserted upon his suggestion alone. When the creed, as, ag as agreed upon by the bishops, was laid before the council, it did not contain this word. Yet it is here stated that it was fully approved by all, and the letter continues, quote, 
no one found occasion to gainsay it. But our beloved emperor was the first to testify that it was the most orthodox and that he coincided in opinion with it, and he exhorted the others to sign it and to receive all the doctrines it contained with the single addition of one word, consubstantial, unquote. No mention of the Pope, is there? And it says, with such facts as these staring them full in the face, it is but little less than the boldest imposture for the papal writers to pretend, as they do, that the proceedings of this council were controlled by instructions from Rome and that the formulary of the creed was prepared there and forwarded, to the leg uh, forwarded by the legates of the Pope. In what estimate can they then can they themselves hold the theory of papal primacy and supremacy when it has been upheld by such wholesale perversions of history? Wholesale perversions of history. Lies. Monstrous lies. And right at the very foundation of this gigantic usurpation of Christ's throne by the so-called Bishop of Rome. It says, The introduction of the one word consubstantial into the creed by the emperor, who, whatever may have been, set, uh, whatever may have been his Christian convictions, was not yet baptized into the church and led one of the fiercest, most protracted controversies the church ever had. The insertion of it, after the assent of all the bishops had been obtained uh, to the form of the creed without it, shows the degree of influence which Constantine, not the Pope, which Constantine had over the council, how completely it was the creature of his imperial will, and how idle and violative of truth it is to say that he would himself have yielded or have permitted others to yield to the dictation of the Bishop of Rome. The latter may have, been, uh, may have commanded respect by his age and piety, but he had no right to command any obedience beyond the limits of his own ecclesiastical jurisdiction, which he may have asserted himself, or which had been asserted by other bishops. Whereas it is well known that Constantine so wore the robes and wielded the imperial power of Caesar as to brook no disobedience to his royal will, whether exercised in the affairs of church or state. Having convoked this council of his own accord, he felt that he had the right to overlook if not to dictate its proceedings, and as the, as the most certain and expedient mode of bringing discordant elements into harmony and saving the cause of Christianity from discomfiture. If any instructions from Rome had been presented, he would have heeded them or not, as he may have, suit, as may have suited his designs." that he was master of everything done there was sufficiently apparent from all proceedings, and if it were not, Theodoret shows that he was at another place. When certain accusations of a criminal character were made against some of the bishops and laid before him, he put them aside till the close of the council, when he burned them publicly, and declared he had never read them, saying, quote, that the crimes of the priest ought not to be made known to the multitude, lest they should become an occasion of offense or of sin. He also said that if he had detected a bishop in the very act of committing adultery, he would have thrown his imperial robe over the unlawful deed, lest any should witness the scene and be thereby injured." Unquote. I wonder if Rome uses that statement by Caesar now to justify their cloaking of the global pedophile priest pandemic in the world, but that's for another discussion. It says, Most amiable and considerate emperor, most fortunate bishops. <laughs> so R.W. Thompson weighs in 
compounding the uh, assertion that the priests were, let's just call them what they are, filthy perverts. And the emperor would have thrown his robe over an adulterous priest to save the church from shame. Uh, that would be an awful big robe today, wouldn't it? And he says, uh, most fortunate bishops. <laughs> Yet it ought not be supposed that any very large number of those who were assembled in this celebrated council needed this kind of royal protection, as it is not to be doubted for a moment that many of them were of the class of sincere Christians in whose care the cause of true Christianity and genuine piety is at all times safe. Those who had control of the proceedings were doubtless, in a great degree, the instruments of Constantine, while such as were really devoted to the welfare of the church were left to acquiesce for fear of royal displeasure and to return to their churches and their and their regulate and to and there regulate by their example the Christian de, uh, deportment of their flocks. Here's the assertion by R. W. Thompson that Emperor Constantine was so authoritative in his conduction of this council that had he done or said something contrary to the true faith of Jesus Christ, those stewards of the Christian faith who were there were forced to just acquiesce. That's how powerful Caesar was at this council. Now, Winninger, now we're back to this Jesuit priest again, this one who goes beyond all reason to use the Council of Nicaea as the establishment of the Pope's divine right and temporal power and popedom, Wenninger makes another equally unsupported assertion when he says that, quote, at the close of the council, all the acts were sent to Rome for confirmation, unquote. <laughs> His object is to maintain by it the proposition, first, that the decrees of the general council are not valid without the approval of the pope, and second, that this approval was obtained before those passed by the Council of Knights took place. <laughs> Nothing of the kind then occurred. There is not a word or a syllable of evidence to that effect. Eusebius says that after the Council had closed, Constantine, quote, gave information of the proceedings of the Synod to those who had not been present by a letter in his own handwriting, unquote, which letter he gives at length. It is imperially addressed by, quote, Constantius Augustus to the churches, unquote. He tells them, quote, I myself have undertaken that this decision should meet the approval of your sagacities, and commands them to receive it as a, quote, divine, a, a truly divine injunction and regard it as a gift of God, unquote, because, quote, whatever is determined in the holy assemblies of the bishops is to be regarded as indicative of the divine will, unquote. He does not refer to the Bishop of Rome at all, either with reference to his approval or otherwise. And when counseling unity of practice in regard to the festival of Easter, he does not refer to the practice at Rome alone or to the decrees of its bishops or to any other particular church to show what that unity is, but tells them that it, it's, that it's consistent, uh, it consists in the practice which prevails in Rome, Africa, Italy, Egypt, Spain, Gaul, Britain, Libya, Greece, Asia, Pontus, and Cilicia, thus ignoring to all intents and purposes the claim of Roman primacy if any such were then made. Eusebius also alludes to a letter from the emperor to the Egyptians as, quote, confirming and sanctioning the decrees of the council, unquote. He wrote to the, the Egyptians, not to the Pope. 
Sozomen alludes to the letter mentioned by Eusebius, written by the emperor to the churches, as well as to the Alexandrians, and says, quote, he urged them to receive unanimously the exposition of faith which had been set forth by the council, unquote, making no reference to the Pope's approval. Socrates gives this letter to the Alexandrians and another to the bishops and people, as well as to those of the churches, and they set forth the binding obligation of the decrees of the council without any reference to the Pope or his connection with them in any way. And Theodoret states the same facts and inserts the same letters. It is not pretended by any of these authors that the decrees of the council were ever submitted to the Pope or that it was supposed to be necessary. The very reverse is true, both as it regards the fact and the universal sentiment then prevailing. However much Rome may have desired her triumph over the old apostolic churches, she had not then achieved it. Why? Because the, the restrainer was restraining the man of sin. And the man of sin would not be revealed until Caesar was taken out of the way. It says, the reference to the proceedings of the council and to the 18th and 29th canons made by this Jesuit priest, Wenninger, to show that it fully recognized the primacy of Rome and the infallibility of the Pope, not only does not help him out of the difficulty, but it gets him deeper into it. We give him the benefit of his statements in his own words. He says this, quote, a yet more now remember this is a Jesuit priest just just pounding the papal infallibility, the pound and pounding the papal sovereignty uh, anvil with his Jesuit hammer, he says, a yet more cogent proof is furnished us by the very acts of the council itself. The eighteenth canon rules that the church, faithful to the teachings of the, the apostles, has reserved all cases of importance to the arbitration of the Holy See. And then he gives this, this in Latin, and I won't butcher it by trying to read it. But it says, Can there be any case of greater importance, major causa, than a question about matters of faith? <laughs> Just building the papal throne as he goes here. And he says, now it so happens, unfortunately, for this author and the cause he supports at the cost of so much candor, that there's not one word in the 18th canon of the Council of Nice which the most skilled and practiced ingenuity can torture into what he has alleged here. On the contrary, the sentiment of the, and action of the Council, so far as it acted at all, was precisely the reverse. The 18th canon is not even upon the subject referred to by Wenninger and makes no reference to it whatsoever. There are no such words to be found in it as cagist, well, I'll butcher it if I try to read it, the, the Latin, which gives primacy to the Pope, and it says it has relation to presbyters receiving the Eucharist from deacons as in these words as translated by Boyle and will deal directly with this canon 18 of the council when we come back from the break. Wenninger's just pulling a rabbit out of his hat, which is typical for Jesuits. Well, we'll continue reading and discussion of the papacy and the civil power on Inquisition Update right after this. Stay tuned. We're going to get right back to the book here. Jesuit priest Wenninger gives the 18th and the 29th canons of the Council of Nicaea as a, fully, a full justification for the recognition of the primacy and the infallibility of the Pope. So, R.W. Thompson's going to deal specifically with the 18th and the 29th canon 
of this Council of Nice to show us that it's a complete fabrication, what Wenninger says. First of all, the 18th canon has absolutely nothing to do with the Pope. And here's what he says. He gives us Canon 18, which is entitled, Of Presbyters Receiving the Eucharist from Deacons. It says this, It having come to the knowledge of the great and holy council, that in certain places and cities the Eucharist is administered by deacons and presbyters, and neither law nor custom permitting that those who have no authority to offer the body of Christ should deliver it to those who have, and it being also understood that some deacons receive the Eucharist before even the bishops, let therefore all these irregularities be removed, and let the deacons remain within their own limits, knowing that they are ministers of the bishops and inferior to the presbyters." Let them receive the Eucharist in their proper place after the presbyters, whether it be administered by a bishop or a presbyter. Nor is it permitted to deacons to sit among the presbyters, as that is against rule and order. If anyone will not obey after, even after these regulations, let him desist from the ministry. Unquote. That's Canon 18. You hear anything in there about the primacy and the infallibility of the, of the Pope? Wenninger says it establishes the primacy and the infallibility of the Pope of Rome. Now, this goes beyond any talent of casuistry that I've ever seen of a Jesuit. This is complete, bold faced fabrication as presuming that no one would ever read the 18th canon of the Council of Nice. Now, the author continues, he says, If it be objected that the translation here used by a, is by a Protestant divine, it is answered that to the same effect is that of the learned Dupin, a doctor of the Sorbonne, and Regis Professor of, Div of Divinity at Paris, and the great Tillamont, whose authority as a Roman Catholic historian, not a Protestant historian, a Roman Catholic historian, is unquestioned, speaking of it, says, quote, the 18th canon humbles the pride of some bishops, or excuse me, some deacons who administered the Eucharist to the priests. It likewise forbids them to sit among the priests, that is, to sit in the church as priests, unquote. Here it is abundantly shown that there could not, by any possibility, have been in this 18th canon anything of the kind alleged by the Jesuit priest Wenninger, and that his statement amounts to an entire perversion of its meaning, that it is, in fact, a palpable misrepresentation of it whether originated by him or some other defender of the papacy, is of no consequence, since forgery and its object are both apparent. That it is a forgery, like the false decretals, the pseudo-Isidorian decretals, which we're going to get into soon in the book, anybody who, would, who will take the pains to investigate may easily see. The Council of Nice not in, uh, did not intend in any part of its proceedings to confer supremacy over the other churches upon that at Rome or upon the Bishop of Rome or to recognize it as existing. The jurisdiction of the several churches as established by ancient usage was defined by the sixth canon, which is thus given by Dupin. Quote, he says... We ordain that the ancient custom shall be observed, which gives power to the bishop of Alexandria over all the provinces of Egypt, Libya, Pentapolis, and Pentapolis, because the bishop of Rome has the like jurisdiction over all the uh, suburbicary regions. And for this, we go to an, another historian. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. 
And he says, we would likewise have the rights and privileges of the church of Antioch and the other churches preserved. But these rights ought not to prejudice those of the metropolitans. If anyone is ordained without the consent of the metropolitan, the council declares that he is no bishop. But if anyone is canonically chosen by the suffrage of almost all the bishops of the province, and if there are but one or two of the contrary opinion, the suffrages of the far greater number ought to carry it for the ordination of those particular persons." Unquote. Tillamont says it was the opinion of Baronius that the necessity for the sixth canon grew out of the resistance by Malicius, the, the bishop of Lycopolis, and founder of the sect called the Malicians, to the authority of the bishop of Alexandria, and thus refers to the canon. Quote, this canon orders that the rights and preeminences of some churches had of old as those of Alexandria and Antioch should be preserved. It regulates the jurisdiction of that of Alexandria over Egypt, Libya, and Pentapolis by that which the Church of Rome, unquote. He then proceeds to show that Ruf this is the author that adds further information, confines the jurisdiction of the Church of Rome to the quote-unquote suburbicary churches only. And thus limited, he considers it to have included no other churches than those existing in Italy, Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica. This canon, as interpreted by both these great Roman Catholic historians, as well as by Boyle, means this, and nothing more, that as the Bishop of Alexandria had power and jurisdiction over the churches in the provinces of Egypt, Libya, and Pentapolis, and the Bishop of Rome had like power and jurisdiction over those in the diocese or suburbs of Rome, so should the bishop of Antioch and the bishops of the other churches have like power and jurisdiction, each within his provincial limits, and each province being required to preserve, according to the ancient custom, the rights of its metropolitan church. There's not one word about the jurisdiction of the bishop of Rome beyond his diocese, not a word about his authority over any other churches but those within the Roman suburbs. Not a word about the appeals to him in cases of disagreement about the selection and ordination of bishops outside his provincial limits. Not a word about the church at Rome as the quote-unquote mother and mistress of all the churches. Not a word about the quote-unquote holy see of Rome not a word about any obligation to obey the Bishop of Rome any more than the bishops of other churches, and not a word about the Pope, either in his pretended capacity as quote-unquote head of the church or any other. With all this before him, it was necessary that this author should have been trained in the Jesuit school in order to fit him for the task of unblushingly shutting his eyes to it. But Dupin leaves no room for doubt about the meaning of the council or the interpretation of the decrees when he says, quote, This canon, being thus explained, has no difficulty in it. It does not oppose the primacy of the Church of Rome, but neither does it establish it. It preserves the great seas their ancient privileges, that is, the jurisdiction or authority which they had over the many provinces, which was afterward called the jurisdiction of the patriarch or exarch. In this sense, it is that it compares the Church of Rome to the Church of Alexandria by considering them as patriarchal churches. It continues also to the Church of Antioch and all the other great churches whatsoever rights they could have but lest their authority should be prejudicial to the ordinary metropolitans who were subject to their jurisdiction, the council confirms what had been ordained in the fourth canon 
concerning the authority of the metropolitans in the ordination of bishops. Unquote. Now, before I even continue, where is any of these other jurisdictions mentioned in the Bible? See, they've already gone way beyond the bounds and the offices that Christ set for his church. The Council of Nice gives authority to bishops and exarchs and metropolitans, and where where is any of this ever mentioned in the Bible? You see, Paul was out of the way. And the corruption that he promised that would come into the church had arrived. And people had plundered the church and took away disciples for themselves to promote their own ideas, contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And building a hierarchical church, which Christ never intended, but be that as it may, we'll continue. It says, It is important to observe scrutinizingly this language of this great author, for it is full of meaning. He says this canon, quote, does not oppose the primacy of the Church of Rome, but neither does it establish it, unquote. Now remember, this is a Roman Catholic historian talking. And he says the reason is plain. Listen to this Roman Catholic historian. He says, quote, No such primacy was then asserted or had then been heard of except in the pretenses set up by a few of the popes or would have been tolerated by the bishops of the other churches. Wow. A Roman Catholic historian saying the uh, primacy of the Pope was never asserted and did not then exist, and if they had it, would the other bishops would have raised Cain about it. Roman Catholic historian. And it says, For these reasons the canon was silent on the subject. But although the, it was silent in words, it rebuked in spirit this ambitious pretense Roman Catholic historian, remember, don't forget, this is a Roman Catholic historian. But although it was silent in words, it rebuked in spirit this ambitious pretense, that is, papal supremacy, by defining distinctly the jurisdiction of each one of the quote-unquote great churches and so defined it that one should not be considered greater or more privileged than the other. No thought of primacy or superiority entered the minds of any of the leading bishops of the council, and if there had been one there to claim it for any particular church, he would have been sternly and indignantly rebuked. The whole history of those times and everything known of this council proves this and whatsoever may be palmed off upon the superstitious and credulous part of the world to establish the contrary is false and forged, manufactured with the same disregard of truth and history as were the pseudo-Isidorian and other fabricated decretals. The metropolitan bishops referred to in these canons had a recognized superiority over the other bishops of their provinces. Originally, the bishops had assistants, or coadjutors, who aided them in the discharge of their episcopal duties when disabled by old age or infirmity. It is supposed that some of these had episcopal ordination, and that others were only presbyters. But in the end, they were all recognized as bishops with limited and distinctly marked jurisdiction. This difficulty was remedied, however, when one of those chosen superior to the re uh, when one was chosen superior to the rest, and invested with certain powers and privileges for the good of the whole. He became the primate or the metropolitan, that is, the principal bishop of the province in which he belonged. Eusebius speak, uh, speaks of Titus as superintendent, that is, 
metropolitan of the churches in Crete. And Chrysostom says that Timothy was instructed with the government of the church throughout Asia. And it was in this sense alone that the jurisdiction and superiority of metropolitan bishops was spoken of by the Council of Nice. Each province or diocese had its own metropolitan bishop or primate, and the idea that the church at Rome was, as it regarded the others, the metropolitan church and its bishop primate over all, never was asserted in this council or even claimed by anybody there so far as any true history shows or even tends to show. Jesuit priest Wenninger, pursuing his favorite idea and seemingly resolved that it should be no fault of his if it is not maintained, as the foundation upon which the claim of papal supremacy must rest, says also this, quote, The 29th canon of Nice reads as follows, quote, The incumbent of the Roman see acting as Christ's vicegerent in the government of the church is the head of the patriarchs as well as Peter himself was. And then he gives the, in Latin to make sure everyone knows that this is not mistranslated. <clears throat> and I won't read it because I'll butcher it. But anyway, he continues, It has already been clearly and sufficiently shown that no such matters as are involved in this statement were considered or acted upon by the Council of Nice at all, insofar as either of the canons referred to is concerned. But after perverting and misquoting and mutilating these, this author overleaps every possible difficulty at a single bound and adds a canon which was never enacted by the council. There are only 20 canons in all passed by the Council of Nice. And such is the undoubted truth of history. Neither Sozomen nor Socrates give the number. Theodoret gives the number as 20. These are his words, quote, The bishops then returned to the council and drew up 20 laws to regulate the discipline of the church, unquote. Dupin says, quote, These rules, which are called canons, are in number 20, and there never were more genuine, though some modern authors have added many more, unquote. There is this note explanatory of this text of Dupin, quote, Theodoret and Rufinus mention only these twenty canons, though the latter reckons twenty-two of them, yet he owned no more because he divided two of them. The bishops of Africa found but twenty of them, after they had inquired very diligently over the East over all the canons made by the Council of Nice. Dionysius Exiguus and all the other collectors of the canons have acknowledged but these twenty. The Arabic canons, which Echelensis published under the name of the Council of Nice, cannot belong to this council. Unquote. Referring again to the twenty canons, he continues, quote, I do not think that there ever were any other acts of this council since, there were since they were unknown to all the ancient historians. There is a Latin letter of this synod to St. Sylvester, who was the bishop of Rome at the time, but is it, it is suppositious. It has no authority, and which has all the marks of forgery that any writing can have, as well as the, pretend, the pretended answer of St. Sylvester. Neither is that council genuine, which is said to have been assembled at Rome by St. Sylvester for the confirmation of the Council of Nice. The canons of this council are also forged, which contain rules contrary to the practice of the time and which it had been impossible to observe." Unquote. Tillamont is less than explicit. In his History of the Council of Nice, he explains the content of the 20 canons and says, quote, 
These are the twenty canons of the famous council which are come to our hands and are the only ones which were made. At least none of the ancients reckoned them more than twenty. Theodoret mentions no more. When the Church of Asia sent, uh, excuse me, the Church of Africa sent to the churches of Alexandria, Antioch, and Constantinople for the canons of, the, of Nice, they sent them only the same twenty which we still have, and the twenty-two of Rufinus contain no more than these twenty, only they were divided after another manner, insomuch that there is no room to believe that any more were made. Unquote. But Tillamont was fully informed of the efforts that had been made, like that of Jesuit priest Wenninger, to add to these canons in order to build up and support the papal system. And as a faithful historian and honest member of the Roman Catholic Church, he felt himself constrained to expose and denounce them. Here's what he says, quote, we find many other determinations attributed to the Council of Nice at the pretended letters of the Popes Mark, Julius, and Felix in a letter from St. Athanasius to Pope Mark in, Gal uh, in Galatius Cisicinus and in an Arabic collection given us by Tyr Tyrianus. But there is nothing more plain than that all these are apocryphal without accepting Galatius, who we know gives us very often suspected pieces, unquote. And he does not spare one of the so-called infallible popes who engaged in this nefarious attempt to add to these canons by forgery in order to affirm the right of appeal to Rome. He says, quote, Pope Zosimus alleged two canons of the Council of Nice which allowed bishops and other ecclesiastics to appeal to the Pope. But the Church of Africa proved these canons to be forged. Neither Zosimus nor his successors were able to prove the contrary, and it is acknowledged now that these canons belong to the Council of Sardicia and not to the Council of Nice, unquote. Unbelievable, isn't it? Bold deception. I mean, it would be easier to believe that the dog ate your son's homework. It says, it is not often that so, uh, so much convincing evidence can be found accumulated upon one point as there is upon this. So overwhelming is it that no writer of the present day, unless he be a Jesuit, will venture to hazard the loss of his reputation for veracity by assigning any other than 20 as the number of the Nicene can canons. One of the most recent investigators of this question among the learned divines of England is Dr. E.B. Pusey, who published a few years ago a history of all the councils from the assembly at Jerusalem in 51 A.D. to the Council of Constantinople in 381. Having before him all the authorities bearing on the question, he fixes the number of Nicene canons at 20 without seeming to suppose the matter debatable. Yet directly in the face of all this, this Jesuit defender of the primacy and, fallibility and infallibility of the Pope unblushingly publishes a false and forged canon, which he calls the 29th, to prove that the Council of Nice thereby declared the Bishop of Rome to be, quote, Christ vigerant in, vicegerent in the government of the Church, unquote, and, quote, the head of the patriarchs as well as Peter was. Unquote. Can bold effrontery be carried further? The forgery, whenever and by whomever made, is bold and entire, made out of the whole, made out of whole cloth. There's not a single word by any of the early fathers that can be contorted or by utmost ingenuity into such a meaning. On the contrary, we have seen that 
where the Bishop of Rome is spoken of in the sixth canon, he is referred to in no other. He is merely called by that title, as all the other bishops are called by their titles, without any indication of preference to him over the others. Lie upon lie. The Roman Catholic Church is a lie. And it rules the world. Pathetic. Pathetic.